The world of business has changed, so we've changed everything with software-defined interconnection, reduced complexity, improved performance, greater flexibility, lower connectivity costs. All with a simple-to-use platform that makes this feel like this. Is effortless and fast, predictable and secure. It's self-provisioning, automated, spin-up connections and flex bandwidth on demand and only pay for what you use. All this within a global community that shares, collaborates and grows together. Take control, cut complexity, make interconnecting effortless with Console Connect. Aloha, I'm Jamie with PTC. We'd like to thank each of you for joining today's session of PTC's webinar series, Frictionless Business sponsored by PCCW Global. Before we turn the time over to our panel, we wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. We will be having Q&A at the bottom of the screen in the Q&A box. Please note that not all the questions may be answered. We also value your feedback. We will be providing a link to a survey. This will be provided in the chat box and in an email after this webinar. This webinar will be recorded and available on PTC's website for you to view afterwards. Within the next 24 hours, we will be sending an email with the link to the survey and how to access that recording. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the time over to our moderator, Joe Wyman. Hi everyone, I'm Joe Wyman. Uh, so glad to welcome you to this first webinar of 2021 um, after the big event. Hope everyone had a great Valentine's Day and we have Something really fascinating actually today because first of all, this is a logically decentralized or logically centralized but physically decentralized call because we have people from Germany, from Shanghai and from the Eastern and West Coast of the US as well as Hawaii. Um, and so uh, even though it's a very international call, we have sort of the uh, Waikiki flavor for PTC. Now, today what we're going to be talking about is the edge, and um, it's an interesting variation on that because we're going to talk about the edge very broadly, but we're also going to talk about a really fascinating emerging trend, and that is the role of automotive and smart cities and telecommunications at the center of this great Venn diagram as technology emerges. And, you know, if we had been uh, holding this webinar 10 years ago, Someone might have said, well, what in the world is uh, an automotive company doing on this call? You know, is there a problem with their call center or something, or maybe internal voice communications? Um, and perhaps OnStar was the beginning of what changed that. So we have a number of interesting trends like increasing microprocessors, increasing connectivity, the role of AI and so forth. So I just think this is going to be a fascinating call and I will be learning uh, probably more than most of you uh, that are in the audience um, because we have such a great distinguished panel of speakers. So without further ado, let me allow them to each introduce themselves and um, perhaps uh, let's start with um, Hagi Schuring, who's from Morelli and Hagi, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, hello, welcome everybody. And I'm the strange guy from automotive. Um, you will see later on that there is a lot of uh, interesting things ongoing also in automotive. Uh, I'm responsible for the business unit electronics. Uh, Marelli is really covering a wide range of uh, technology, uh, electrical powertrain, powertrain standard uh, Y, uh, electronics itself. And we are really dealing with the convenience that is getting into the car. And uh, later on in the discussion, you will see very clearly that there's a lot of interactions with the edge, with the cloud, with the connectivity, and the world has completely changed. At Morelli, we really look into this from a holistic uh, viewpoint. Uh, we also see this uh, as one of the big trends, the cabin, the convenience at the cabin. And we see also very clearly the hardware shifting uh, to a more content-oriented setup, everything uh, centered around uh, safety. Uh, and I would say also going forward on how to drive uh, autonomous and also electrically. 
Uh, but also the convenience part is one important thing that I'm uh, responsible of. And I think we have enough opportunity later on to discuss about that. Thank you again. Yeah, for I'm old enough. Sorry, I'm old enough to remember uh, rotary dial phones. And then the first uh, mobility was the coiled cord on princess phones. Then we had uh, wireless phones. Then we had smartphones. Now the latest hot wireless accessory is a uh, automobile, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. So, John Cowan, can you say a few words about yourself and your company? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I'm John Cowan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called EdgeX. Um, EdgeX is a, is a company that was started um, in the realization that there's a confluence of various forces taking shape in the industry across um, different segments, uh, edge computing, uh, the, the cloud, cloud computing, and this Internet of Things. And you know, what we realized at EdgeX a few years ago was that, you know, the, the cloud and the way that we think about orchestrating applications today was really not conducive to this idea of compute needing to be located close to uh, sensors and devices and connected things in order to process information at ultra low latency and at ultra low cost at scale. And um, as we thought about that problem, we realized that you know, the Internet of Things, if we see this through to its, uh, its end state, is quite frankly going to be the largest uh, paradigm shift in the history of the Internet. Um, it will dwarf everything that came before it. And that's because, uh, you know, we're moving from this world of abstract applications like spreadsheets and Zoom calls and these kinds of things and into a world where software um, is, is super critical to the operation of machinery. It's a very real world application development environment where you know latency is, can you know spell the difference between life and death uh, profit and and um and wealth and uh and ultimately um you know um, emergency response as we'll see in the connected and autonomous vehicle landscape so we see these kinds of things coming together and what we decided was that in order for this to really kind of you know come to fruition there would need to be high performance computers located everywhere, ideally within a thousand feet of every connected thing, every connected sensor, every connected device, machine, what have you. And to achieve that, you know, we would have to rethink, um, A, how we architect applications from a centralized perspective, um, and B, how we achieve multi-tenancy, right? It doesn't make sense the way that IoT is, is working today to continue uh, single tenancy. Uh, not everybody, Morelli can't put a private solution in place at a street corner for its autonomous vehicles and every other automotive vendor and every other car company and every other uh, technology purveyor, there's just not enough real estate, right? Uh, if computing has to move to this far edge, which I kind of call the street corner, um, multi-tenancy must be extended. And that's a very difficult thing given the way that we built the cloud over the last 10 to 15 years in a very centralized way. So that's what EdgeX is, is kind of focused on, Joe. Um, we built a platform that allows for these kinds of things to take shape. And we're working um, heavily in, <clears throat> in uh, the autonomous uh, things industry as well as, um, as, well as automotive, uh, squarely focused on helping to achieve uh, ambitions worldwide for things like Vision Zero. Like, um, we think that uh, the future of the Sorry, edge- what's, what's Vision Zero? Vision Zero Vision is Zero. the ambition to achieve zero traffic fatalities um, in any urban environment. And we believe that um, obviously the Internet of Things, connected and autonomous vehicles, intelligent vehicles are crucial to that safety vision. Well, I live in the suburbs, so hopefully there's a vision for suburb fatalities as well. Well, I think if we just keep you off the road, the suburbs will be okay. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, continuing from east to west, Mark from Las Vegas, Mark Teeley. Hey, thanks, Joe. Um, pleasure to be here. I, uh, Mark Teeley, co founder and CEO for a startup called Edgevana. Um, and uh, uh, interestingly enough, we see the market opportunity and the changes in the market very similar to the way John described them, um, especially in the volume and the confluence of opportunities and demand um, closer to where the consumer is using solutions, whether that consumer is a robot, a vehicle, uh, or a human in almost any circumstance. And so uh, Jvana was founded with the notion of making access to global infrastructure networks, um, data center capacity, uh, um, compute capacity, et cetera, available to um, the consumer, consumer being the enterprise, consumer being uh, 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 any one of the internet companies, uh, making that access uh, uh, dramatically 
easier, simpler, more like an easy button, as it were, for gaining access to the world. Uh, today, it can take months to create a contract with one co-location company that you've already worked with uh, uh, and put um, equipment into a new facility. Um, if you're trying to do that in 10 countries uh, uh, or 100 countries uh, or 1,000 locations, as an example, it's, it's not feasible to assume you can depend on the centralized nature of the distribution of compute and data center capacity by the big players in the market. So Edgevana is there to leverage not only those centralized resources, but the extended resources of every data center that's on the market today around the world and putting that at your fingertips so that having a number of data centers in a number of countries can be um, the perfect choices for you as opposed to the pragmatic choice of, well, this particular company gets me as close as I can get um, with, the, with the ownership perspective of simplified contracting and simplified billing. Makes sense. Okay, and uh, ending up in China, uh, Professor Yang, can you say a little bit about yourself and your role? Thank you, Joe. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yang Yang. I'm from uh, Shanghai Tech University. I'm the director for uh, Shanghai Institute for, uh, for Computing Technology. Uh, just following Mark's uh, comment, uh, we are focusing on uh, the, sh the shifting of the uh, tasks uh, between different computing resources. Uh, we, we just want to minimize the delay, as Joe, uh, John just mentioned. Uh, but we try to balance the communication cost and the computing power in different locations to save uh, additional uh, processing and delay uh, for the customers. So we are focusing on the algorithms uh, to distribute the tasks among a group of uh, computing nodes so that they can minimize the delay for all the users. Thank you. Okay, so Professor, if I can stay with you for a second, maybe you could talk uh, a little bit about um, what's going on in China. And I'd like maybe everyone to share their perspective as to what the edge actually is. Um, and, you know, China is probably uh, furthest ahead, uh, or if it's not uh, ahead, it's at least uh, tied in first place for 5G rollouts, 5G test beds in various cities. Um, so can you talk a little bit about maybe the confluence of edge and 5G and automotive and kind of what, how edge is being interpreted in China? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Joe, uh, for this question. Uh, edge is uh, considered as the, one of the key applications for 5G now in China um, because they think, uh, we think that uh, uh, all the 5G applications in the future need extra computing resources to handle the high data rate uh, streaming of data uh, for big cities and for customers, especially uh, for those customers love uh, videos. Um, so uh, in China, uh, uh, as, as far as I know, uh, we put age at work in different scenarios. Uh, one of the scenar most important scenario is uh, smart cities. Uh, Chinese government, uh, push very hard to digitize uh, many services uh, for different uh, government uh, in different uh, provinces. So uh, many cities are now moving very fast to combine IoT together with big data, cloud, and edge computing technologies together. Uh, with the help of 5G communication networks, they can um, minim uh, minimize the delay for most of the application uh, uh, rely on this uh, uh, latency uh, saving uh, uh, properties such as uh, uh, intelligent transportation for big cities and also the, the video games uh, for a group of users in different locations. Um, another key application for uh, age computing is for smart uh, factories. Uh, some uh, uh, big factories now use age computing to minimize the processing of the local data in the factories so that they can save a lot of resource to uh, build this uh, dedicated network, moving the data from their factories to the cloud or data centers. So those are the key uh, areas I can see uh, in China uh, using edge computing in their daily manufacturing and man management for big cities. 
So maybe before I re-ask the question, um, you kind of talked about uh, some edge application areas, um, some sort of uh, nationally directed perhaps edge strategies, and also that benefits are not just latency, but also backhaul bandwidth. So let me uh, expand my original question to say, um, and I'll go back the other way around the world um, with you, Mark, is um, you know, how do you think about what the edge actually is and also um, maybe important use case areas and sort of benefits like latency and backhaul traffic reduction. Yeah. Um, so, you know, define, obviously, you don't probably don't want me to get into a detail of defining what all the edge is. I think what's, what's important. Actually, I would. Okay. We'll take the next 45 minutes. No. Um, the, um, <laughs> Let me yeah. get my slide deck. John, John, uh, <laughs> John Hoggy, you guys can just go home. We're, we're... Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot, guys. Um, yeah, the, the interesting thing about the edge uh, and trying to define it is, you know, uh, I think during our last discussion, I tried to define it more as a as a financial location, right? Uh, edge is where you can bring appropriate technology together at the right cost to create a new business opportunity or solve a problem uh, and still realize appropriate ROI. So if that um, is five feet from the customer or five miles or 500 miles, that really is where edge is. And, and, you know, as John has talked about, as Professor Yang has talked about, as Ahagi has talked about, the opportunity to, to best fit technology for the opportunity has never been better in the technology space. And um, edge, using edge more dynamically for delivering solutions um, uh, around real-time um, data analytics uh, or emergency response uh, or deeper entertainment and customer engagement models uh, um, for shoppers or people experiencing even a national park or an event center in a city. All of these are edge opportunities. Each of them come with different dynamics and different ROI, but <clears throat> to, to something John uh, talks about a lot, one of the, and, and even Professor Yang just mentioned, one of the key characteristics of edge we always talk about is latency. And, and latency has been the driver. Uh, I, I preach latency, everybody has preached latency for the last five or six years for any of us who have cared to hear or talk about edge. And it's still one of, if not the key driver for edge. But what is interesting, and I think begs continued conversation, is that the volume of data being created is surprising even those who thought the volume of data was gonna be a problem. And the idea of trying to centralize that data when data is actually one of the most expensive things to move around and manipulate, especially if you're trying to move it in and out of a public cloud, the financial models for actually manipulating that data where it's created um, uh, become much more obvious, right? So edge is as much about latency um, as it is now about uh, uh, effective cost management and, and getting better value from that data in real time, right where that data is created. And um, in many cases, uh, as some of the examples have been pointed out here, one of the key areas of opportunity that um, I've been working with some of our customers and partners on is in the manufacturing sector and in the, on the supply chain and um, uh, the ability to provide real time safety on the shop floor. Uh, to, you know, John pointed out to, about the zero deaths in cities. The same sort of thing applies to many manufacturing facilities. How do we get zero injuries in our facilities from the manufacturing line? How do we use um, in the data center environments and in the, in the manufacturing environments, how do we use real-time AI to determine better um, maintenance schedules for hardware or when to shut down a line, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And those are, I think, some of the areas where edge is a little bit better encapsulated, if that's the right word. And so it's an easier target of opportunity. And, and what I'm just beginning to see um, are people that are looking at more global widespread solutions and really global widespread solutions around things like um, data governance, uh, around um, improved security performance at the edge, um, uh, certainly around gaming and entertainment uh, and um, again, as John has pointed out, as Huggy has pointed out, um, the uh, automotive sector 
uh, is picking up more and more steam as people realize that the initial idea of edge was to solve for the connected car or the or the uh, and 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 5g was was only needed because the connected car that's what everybody referred to and then we went through this period of like okay we've over talked the connected car um but the reality is is that the the automobile traffic planning the applications that will be used in automobiles the applications that will be used to manage what happens with automobiles on the road etc are in fact a perfect playground for edge solutions. So Mark, you uh, you addressed a bunch of things adding to the list of benefits, including um, being able to manage data volumes and uh, either shortening the OODA loop or reducing time to decision or time to action, whatever you would want to call it. Um, so John, I bet you have some thoughts on how to optimize economics of the edge and also nope, none, um, things zero. like sensor fusion uh, and how like uh, data volume compression is critical. So um, I'll turn it over to you and ask you, how do you think about the edge and its benefits and critical use cases? Okay, so my, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dial this back a little bit to explain the edge in the context of a simple um, architecture that you can picture in your mind's eye. Okay, so the internet, the rough architecture of an internet of things application, an intelligent application is a sensor, a processor and an actuator, right? So I, I have sensors creating raw data. I have a machine that's processing that information that's creating intelligence and then an actuator where it's, it, is, it is used, it's displayed, it's used, it's acted upon, okay? So today, that three-stage model of sensor, processor, actuator is separated into my camera or my acoustic device or my LiDAR or my radar, the cloud, which is the processor today, and then the actuator might be a heads-up display and a, a C2X, C2VX enabled uh, vehicle or something like that, okay? Today, the architecture is, to, is that the processor is located close to the actuator in the sense that the, 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 the distance between the sensor and the processor itself is, is far away. And that's fundamentally the challenge, right? So what we wanna do in the edge, the whole principle, the whole idea of the edge is moving the processor closer to the sensor so that the intelligence can be created with low latency uh, where the sensor is feeding data in you know, sub millisecond um, round trip latency times. Once that intelligence is created by the processor, it then, it, only that is communicated to the actuator, okay? That's the ambition of the edge. So when we say that our ambition at EdgeX is that, look, compute needs to be located everywhere within a thousand feet of every connected thing. That's what we're after. We're after putting the, 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 the central processing unit of that architecture close to the sensor. And when you think about the plurality of sensors that are required in a smart city, right? I mean, a car doesn't depend on one sensor. It depends on dozens of sensors, countless sources of information. Sensor data fusion becomes a very real challenge Okay, on a street corner, okay, where it's got to be processed and communicated as a vehicle is moving and hurtling down the road. That's the challenge of the edge and why we say ultimately what's, what's central to the edge is decentralization, highly distributed computers. We need the edge to behave more like we think of the internet today. The internet isn't a hub and spoke model where there's one monolithic centralized delivery vehicle for the internet. It's a constellation of devices that act in concert and pass packets between each other in order to communicate between point A and point B. The edge needs to be like that, right? The edge needs to be the internet of computers so that the processing is, is located close to where the sensors are and the, and the intelligence that's created there at the edge can be broadcast to the necessary actuators, to the necessary things that require that information to stop my vehicle, to reroute traffic, to Dis, you know, dispatch, emergency response, whatever the, ha whatever the use case is that you're after. Okay, Hagi, do you uh, agree with all of that stuff and how does it apply to specifically what you're doing in automotive as far as your priority areas and, uh, you know, what keeps you up at night and where you're putting your investment dollars and so forth? Yeah, I think when I when I listen to that, uh, sometimes if I think a couple of years back, it uh, looked like I lived in the Stone Age. Okay? So when uh, we have had uh, our electronic components, they were just in the car. Okay, and when we look into the edge today, it's basically the capability to connect all the sensors with all kinds of information 
to the rest of the world. Okay, and it's not only the the, the sensor information, but it's a it's a full spectrum of all kinds of technologies, information, uh, uh, autonomous driving, uh, interaction with the smart city, but also convenience areas to look into. We even have applications uh, where we do the telemetry of the Formula One, which is also based on an edge and is really something which is super hot and super critical that is not even able to run on an existing net, but uh, a private net, but it's also using the same principles. You distribute uh, the, um, let me say, horsepower of the computing into the areas where you can really uh, populate it best. And then you need to make sure that you as an overarching architecture that is really consolidating this into, let me say, a common result. Okay. So when we look into, uh, for instance, autonomous driving, if you want to have information, you need to be very fast for all the uh, safety critical components. So you cannot rely on emergency brake being calculated somewhere remotely in a server center. So you need to have this as a, as a local, as John said, very, I would say, close to the sensor uh, computing power, but you need to add some information potentially that is coming from the cloud, from somewhere in the internet without being very specific, that is telling you that there is a deep, steep uh, curve coming up and you need to break. Right. Uh, so I think it is very important to really also look into the to the edge at something that is now uh, increasing the the web, the spider web of connections of nodes. You need to imagine this as a car that has a has a connector into it, but in this case, it's a five G connection uh, that is enabling all these pipeline of data going in and also out. Uh, I think one of the the challenges that we have also with the edge is when you look into current smartphone, it is much more related to a lot of downloads. Okay, but we all want to also do uploads, uh, which yeah. are very safety critical. And when I look into the typical, let me say, car environment from the past or vehicle in general, there was always the design to the need. Okay, so you had a specification which processor fits. Uh, this was a design principle. What we see today is we see so many ECUs coming up. Uh, there is like 200 C ECUs uh, and counting. It is a complexity that you cannot manage anymore. And if you take these, I would say, very complicated network in the vehicle and really consolidate this in a much more domain-oriented controllers that are really helping you to also have the features being even moved between the different uh, processing units, uh, then you have achieved really a simplification and you're ready also for the future and the future input. And Edge is one of the, I would say, enablers that is using technology that is already used in a lot of the areas. And we are basically uh, investing in this area, specifically in the domain controllers uh, that are covering the different areas, the domain controllers of the classical powertrain, electrical powertrain, uh, the autonomous driving domain controller and also the cabin controller mm -hmm. that is something that is really uh, uh, processing not only uh, the content that you display but also making decisions uh, on uh, a certain basis that you can uh, drive from different angles how the information also under the aspect of being safety critical is displayed to you. So for us uh, the edge is a fundamental change on how we design and also how we think uh, in this setup. And there was a mentioning before on manufacturing. Uh, we even have uh, the data lake approach on something that is just producing data and you get a lot of output that you would not ever even see if you do it manually. So there's a lot of, I would say, turnaround in the automotive industry. There's also a lot of uncertainty because uh, the typical, let me say, automotive manager is not really used to think edge or software or these architecture, internet of things, as you said, John, yeah. and really uh, making the big picture on connecting everything together. So this is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of the discussion that is ongoing uh, also specifically is like this hype 5G will make everything better. Um, I think it is very important to understand what is the change and how do we need to think about it. 
And uh, when we look into a very simple example, just to, to finish this thought up, if I ask my children, uh, where is the folder or their hard drive, they look at me like if I would talk about something that is not existing. So the next generation is not even thinking hardware anymore. They are thinking content. And it would be very difficult to explain to somebody why you should not have the same content that you can carry around on your phone, also in your car. And so, Hagi, if I could um, delve into that a little bit more and maybe ask for comments from everyone else on this. It, it strikes me that what you just said leads to some very interesting uh, sort of observations around what's going on. So, you know, we're used to thinking about different industries, right? And so we know that maybe sports broadcasting applications for the edge are probably going to be a little bit different than automotive and smart cities applications. But um, what you're pointing out further is that not only do you need to think about like different industries and even in the segments within that, right? Because Formula One racing is very different than say ambulances is very different than people out for Sunday drive is different than ride shares. But you're also pointing out something critical, uh, which is that there are different domains. So there is the safety domain, the entertainment domain, and so forth, and they each have their sort of interesting variations, right? So maybe entertainment right now is mainly downloads, but presumably with autonomous vehicles, we're going to be doing these kind of uh, video conference Zoom type sessions literally as we're zooming down the road in our autonomous vehicle yeah, yes. uh, with high bandwidth, low latency connectivity. So um, maybe if we could delve into some of those, when you think about the architecture for maybe a particular use case that is interesting, let's take um, you know, your point about having access to global information, like the fact that there's downhill coming up or that there's a traffic jam coming up and therefore uh, I can begin to lay off the gas because there's no point in accelerating when I know I'm going to have to brake and thereby I can perhaps minimize fuel consumption. Um, GE does something like that with their uh, railway um, movement application. Um, so it's like just natural to apply it to cars as well. So I don't know if that's a good example case or not, but um, can you go through how do you think about the architecture for those kinds of applications, including that, you know, sensors in the accelerator, uh, sensors as to the speedometer, you know, being able to handle it locally, securely provide it to the edge, what happens, how would we use John's or Mark's solutions to help kind of address the computational needs and compress yeah. those response times for that? So, hey, Joe, real, I'll, I'll say, let me just say really quick that, I, you know, everything that you articulated, HG, I think is is spot on. I think you guys are, are well ahead of the curve in terms of the research around the edge. But, you know, the $64,000 question for the edge is how do you achieve multi-tenancy? Because it's, you know, like, like as, as I said in, the, in my uh, earlier monologue, um, it's one thing to create a single tenant solution from end to end, you know, from sensor to processor to actuator, but how do you achieve that at a, with, a, with a plurality of constituents, different actors, a whole ecosystem of users? How do you do at the edge what we did for the cloud and web services 10 years ago, All right? That, that, that to us is where the, the paths of commercialization and rapid development are gonna converge in this industry. John, how would you suggest solving it? Well, uh, well, this is this is what we're this is the research that's taken us years um, in, in in the work that we're doing is figure is how to crack that nut is how to figure that out and um, you know we have we have a particular at Edgex we have a particular um, thesis for how to achieve that and um, you know again without you know going into too much uh, too much of that detail at this stage what I would say is that. You know, we, what we found is that um, the path to doing that is, um, is it creating cloud services in a dis highly distributed fashion. So being able to present multi-tenant cloud services that the ecosystem of software developers and the Internet of Things are, will require and do require in order to build what they want to build um, and consume the data that's necessary from the sensors to do the processing, um, do that in a way that is highly distributed. And take out, what we did is we achieved uh, is taking out the center point of cloud. So EdgeX isn't like an AWS where it's like, 
you know, we, we are the center of the universe kind of deal. What we've done is created an operating system that's deployable onto high performance machines. And when you boot that operating system, it joins a peer to peer mesh, a content addressable peer to peer network of computers that allows for the gossip of code and data the way that the internet works, the way that the same way that routing tables work for our packets going from A to B. So that this, and we call this concept edge net, right? Um, so that you have a, you have a, a multi-tenant cloud service uh, like a CDN or like serverless functions or object storage or what have you um, ev everywhere that, that, that a computer exists and is connected to a network. And uh, Professor Yang, what do you think about that John solution? Yeah, I think that's uh, exactly uh, H uh, should go to because that, uh, the power of H uh, is that we combine the resource at the different locations belonging to different people together to serve everyone. So, um, so that we can maximize the, uh, the, the power of unused resource. Uh, the key problem uh, in John's uh, question is uh, how to build up this trust between the users and also the tenants, uh, the providers of those computing yeah. resources. Um, we, uh, at the university, we are concentrated on a wireless solution for that. Uh, it's uh, especially uh, challenging, uh, but good for the PhD students to study is to balance this, uh, these issues in the wireless scenario when you have a, a communication cost uh, versus this computing uh, a resource gain uh, in, in the real, in solving the real problem. So uh, what we are doing now in my lab is to build up these kind of demos to show that uh, one task can, sh uh, can be uh, divided uh, into smaller tasks among several talents and they can handle the problem together. Uh, but we haven't dealing with the challenging uh, security and the privacy issues yet. Mm -hmm. Those are the key questions I think uh, uh, John uh, is going to solve uh, in, yeah, in his uh, Ajax. Yeah, we have, there's, there's, yeah, I, I agree. Like security, um, data governance, um, you know, immutability, these are all, these, these all become very heightened uh, dynamics in the internet of things, right? I mean, I can't afford to take the risk that uh, a, 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 a function that's executed on the network um, was compromised in any way. The insertion of one line of code could, um, you know, drive my Tesla off the road. Um, those kinds of, those are very real world uh, risks. Yeah. The approach that we took in, in solving the problem was to borrow from the concept of trustlessness that we learned um, in the early days of blockchain. Um, the idea that you can take out the central authority of trust or distribute trust across multiple parties um, is a, is, a, is a philosophy that we, uh, we embodied in, in what we built so that any code that any code or data on the network that you know that exists in a multi-tenant basis can be cryptographically verified at the point of execution or the point of, of usage. So in that way, you know code and data that is written to the to a, a, a plurality of nodes and network that we're creating is assured that when it's when it's used, it is in fact the code or data that was written um, on day zero. Um, so. You know things like that. Those are those are um, very important research tracks as we continue this path to commercializing the edge and and you know realizing what the Internet of Things is going to be to the world. Uh, I, I, Joe, if you don't mind, really quickly, um, I was just going to say, Mark, I'm sure you have something to add. So, well, no, uh, I mean everything that's been said uh, in the last five minutes, uh, I agree with. In fact, it's sort of a a foundational kind of kind of a uh, for the dumber guys like me, um, building edge Vana is more of the foundation for exactly what Professor Yang and Hagi and John have just been talking about, um, especially the, the maximizing the utilization of the resource that's available to you, right? I mean, that's a kind of an underlying theme of what's being talked about. And uh, even in a blog I just published recently that was sort of for fun, but it highlights the amount of demand that's likely to occur at the edge over the next five to 10 years. And uh, the way I look at that demand curve and how we'll provision it is we can look at it and say, that's too much, we can't build that. With carrying forward the assumptions that we would build it and use it the same way we've built and used what's already been created. And my assumption is the opportunity at the edge is too large 
whether it's whether it's money, safety, convenience, entertainment, the opportunity is too large. So solving for how to maximize utilization of resource at the edge uh, is fundamental to the growth of that marketplace. So similarly to way, to the way that that Google uh, and uh, Amazon and Microsoft solved for well, it used to be 50 servers per admin, and then it was 100 servers per admin, and then it was 500 servers per admin, and then it was 25,000 servers per admin. If they hadn't solved that problem, those businesses never could have scaled. Hmm. They just couldn't. It's, so, not about, it's not about what they would have built. They just couldn't have built it because financially it would not have worked. That problem occurs in many layers of the development of Edge from the utilization of networks to the utilization of data center capacity and floor space to the utilization of CPU memory and storage at the edge. And I don't think we can get away from the idea that John just expressed where all of that needs to be shared as effectively as possible via multi-tenancy. I, I, think, I think fractionalizing the supply chain is an important dynamic for the edge because like, look, I, okay, I'll go on the record and say, I am not a fan of the naturally formed oligopolies in the internet. I, I hate the fact that 90% of the internet traffic is, has to traverse. You have to basically gate through, phase gate through two companies, whether it's Facebook or Google. That's bad for business. It's bad for the industry. It's bad for the internet. And if that happens at the edge, it'll be that problem times a thousand. We don't want to see that. So we took approach, you know, because, because we're not a center point, we're not a platform operator like Amazon Web Services. We took the approach of Let's make this a participatory network. I mean, I can't scale to the you know hundreds of thousands of node locations that would be necessary to to effect what we're trying to build by putting computers everywhere within a thousand feet of connected things without a lot of participation. And, and to Mark's point, like you know why Edgevana and EdgeX are kind of like you know uh, tongue and groove a little bit in in building this out is because. I also don't have the time to run like year long uh, RFP cycles and all of this kind of stuff. There's thousands of data centers and thousands, hundreds of thousands of possible node locations um, to affect this. So, you know, what Mark does is streamline that, right? What Mark does is say, look, at the end of the day, I can, you know, he's, he's organizing this ecosystem of supply chain and, you know, we're trying to build the platform on top to stitch them all together and keep this highly decentralized from an economic perspective at the edge. So um, I think Mark, you bring up an interesting question um, and I'd like to uh, use that to open it up to a broader set of questions and go back to Hagi and Yang Yang for a second, which is uh, talking about resources available at the edge. Um, you guys mentioned a number of things, uh, issues, including uh, trust or trustlessness and privacy and, and security. It seems like another key one potentially has to do with resource contention, right? You wouldn't want to be heading towards a brick wall in your car at 80 miles an hour and uh, basically have edge resources say the computing equivalent of, uh, we're sorry, uh, we're experiencing heavier than normal uh, volume right now, you're number 17 in line. So um, my immediate question is, what do we do about resource contention and class of service? And uh, sort of a broader question, and if I can go back to Hagi and also Professor Yang, would be um, how do we think about both the business challenges, right? In other words, from your perspective, Hagi, is everything, you know, this is smooth sailing, it's easy, we've done it a million times before. You already mentioned some of the skills questions, which is, you know, people were busy designing engines or transmissions, now you're having them write software. And Professor Yang, from your perspective, um, you know, you could obviously address business challenges in China, but uh, since you're at Shanghai Tech University, what do you see as being some of maybe the research challenges? And then uh, I'll turn it over to um, Mark and John to, uh, to basically say, you know, what do you see as far as the challenges that your customers are facing? So Hagi, if I can start with you around main business challenges. Yeah, I think uh, Mark brought up a very good point, which is also for us a, a key driver, okay, scaling. Okay, how do you scale? Because if the car is on the road, uh, it's on the road, okay? You don't get it back and try to put a different domain controller in, it's on the road. So we, we have seen in the past a trend that you really design to the need. Uh, really, what do I need to have? How do I balance the MP3 uh, playback versus the safety critical issues? 
Today, the challenges are quite different because at the end, the MPC, uh, MP3 playback is not critical, we all know, but it's also running almost in the idle time of the rest of the system when we look into this. So uh, the challenges in automotive uh, is, uh, I think, very different because thinking that your car has something extra is a little bit more expensive on the computing side. It's not a typical thought that the OEM usually has. Okay, so we see that this is changing, uh, but I think we see also a lot of these, um, I would say, requirements that we have right now are really getting much more abstracted from the hardware. Uh, when we look at the typical hardware cycle, we talk about two years roughly, that it uh, takes you to bring something validated, everything on the street. When you look into the software cycle, it is very different. Uh, and when we look into how we are benefiting, let me say, from the, from the new age of uh, being very independent from the hardware source power, I think the edge thought process there is really helping us a lot on making sure that we can offer something that is not from the beginning uh, designed into the system. So our components in the future uh, and today already are upgradable, but we'll have more features coming in and more distributed services. Mm. And uh, when we look into the architecture that we have right now, our main driver right now is making sure that we have the functional safety part uh, addressed, which is the critical one, time critical, as you said, you are maybe in a tunnel, you have no connection, um, but you need to still make the decision if that is a truck or a train coming in front of you. But on the other side, it is also very important to say, how do we make these emergency handling, uh, the decision, the master of the HMI and also the sensor processing, how do we balance that? So we will focus on really putting these attention into the use cases that are very important for saving the vision zero uh, setup to really achieve it and make sure also that the complexity is not going somewhere where the system overall is maybe maximum distributed but not coming together. So this is our main drivers really looking into what is the architecture, uh, how is the operating system really interacting with the hardware, where are the boundaries, sandboxing is one of the topics really making sure that you cannot hack into the system uh, cryptography is, uh, I think, one of the key fundamentals in the connection. And then really making everything as one piece very flawless compared to the rest of the world. There is no reason that the car should not act like a computer, okay? because the horsepower is there, we're using the same chips. So just a quick follow-up, if I can. So um, your CEO of the business, um, I guess, how do you even go through that, that transition, right? So in other words, you have, I don't know, several thousand people that have been, you know, determining what plastic to use in airbags or what <laughs> metal to use in brakes. And now all of a sudden you're talking about these thorny computational problems. Is that, did you like hire like, you know, a thousand computer scientists or engineers, or do you partner with like, TU Berlin or TU Wien or how, what do you do? How do you make this enormous transition? Yeah, it's a, I, I, I would like to say uh, still when we have the sofa on wheels that everybody is dreaming of, you need still to have the fabric for the, for the sofa. But uh, nevertheless, uh, all the computing power, of course, needs to be set up. We have a, a strategy of uh, really changing the footprint. Uh, we have just recently partnered up with Vipro in India to really have uh, the horsepower coming into. Uh, we have our own technical service center and we have very strong relationship to the universities for all the technical aspects. Uh, in Italy, uh, our home base, uh, the Polytechnico uh, in Torino, uh, in Germany, we have a couple ones, uh, even in, in Shanghai, Guangzhou, we are very active. We have a strong team in China that is really helping us to see the trend. Uh, and we see an interesting uh, also activity when we look into China, really leapfrogging generations, not having the boundaries of the past legacy. And this is enabling us to really 
see a different way of, of uh, uh, looking into the execution. Uh, if I can uh, explain in a short example, the time frame that we are talking about. When we launched with BMW a head unit, it is a time frame of 36 months of from start of design to, uh, to start of production. Now with our Chinese customers, we are implementing a cockpit domain controller in eight months. And uh, uh, this is really record time. Uh, and this is only possible if you have the right talent, if you have the right architecture, if you are relying on a platform, if you do a stable reuse and have a quality of code. And this is only going together with the right people on board that we of course cannot change from today to tomorrow from a plastic engineer to a software engineer. But we have started already a couple of years ago to put a very strong software oriented organization in place that is really also based on this open source mindset uh, using the typical tools that the open source community is using, uh, continuous integration, all these things that are really enable you to be fast, uh, agile software process management. And this is a process where we are strongly growing. Okay, It's not from today to tomorrow, but we have seen this change coming in already a couple of years ago and we have acted accordingly. And I think uh, at the moment we are quite confident that we can keep up with the challenges, although uh, the complexity is even going up and we need to even have another step added to the overall strategy. Uh, Professor Yang, uh, any comments on kind of interesting challenges that you're facing or moreover, given, um, you know, the 13th five-year plan and uh, the priorities of edge and AI and robotics and um, 5G in China, any comments on sort of the main things that you're wrestling with? Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the uh, key challenge uh, for everyone here uh, or for the future industry is the change of the architecture uh, of the future service. As uh, uh, John just mentioned, uh, previously cloud is uh, far away from the sensors. So we rely on the communication network to shift the data between the uh, sensors and the, the cloud. But with age, we actually fundamentally change the, the business and change the game. So we have a new architecture. This architecture uh, do not have this kind of a cloud channel sensor or terminal type of uh, uh, three layer, uh, uh, those kind of three layers. We actually put intelligence everywhere in the neighborhood. Uh, that requires uh, uh, to develop a very efficient operating system to handle the, uh, the heterogeneous uh, system uh, or heterogeneous heterogeneous devices in your neighborhood. Those, uh, this, I believe, is the key technical challenges for, yep. uh, for the implementation of edge computing for every industry. Uh, Hoggy also mentioned the uh, operating system is so important for the autom uh, automotive industry. I believe if you want to maximize the, uh, the utilization of the resources in the neighborhood, you have to uh, have this kind of uh, uh, operating system which is trusted uh, by everyone in the in the neighborhood, and then the resources and the data can be shared uh, between them, and they realize the potential of uh, edge computing. So, um, you know, stick with the automotive theme a little bit more. One interesting thing that uh, Joe, seems like add, it's... Joe, can I add one thing? Sure. Sorry, I just want to say one one thing we don't talk about at the edge is the network, and so I, I would describe one of the big big sort of like huge obstacles that the industry is going to require from the telecommunications industry. And hands up if you can point me in the direction of somebody that can give me this, but what I need is a wireless network with 100% SLA and no limitation of liability. Yeah, well, that's interesting. The 100% SLA is the theoretical five nines for 5G, but uh, the limitation of liability, I'm gonna have to get back to you on. So, um, <laughs> exactly, Sm <laughs> smoking yeah, like a real we'll American. That brings up an interesting question because presumably, you know, liability gets into what happens if uh, the car is taken over by ransomware, um, you know, say, or what happens if a car is about to crash into things. And so, Mark, a question for you is, you know, people talk about autonomous vehicles and you could say, one could argue autonomous vehicles by their definition are autonomous. They don't need to be connected. Um, so doesn't autonomy 
in the vehicle mean like no real need for connectivity or how does all that fit together? Yeah, I would, I would argue, Joe, in a broader sense. I mean, this applies to the autonomous vehicle, but it even applies to the phone that you carry in your pocket or a smart building is that the smarter we make the device, in this case, an automobile, um, the smarter we need the surroundings to be. And by smarter, that means we need more capability. We need, we need capability outside of the vehicle that is bigger and more advanced than the actual vehicle itself, which is an irony because I'm sure almost everybody on this call right now has been asked at one point, well, our phones are getting so smart, pretty soon we won't need anything else. And it's just the opposite. As we make a laptop smarter, as we make a phone smarter, as we make a car smarter, the, the infrastructure to support the use of those smart tools um, needs to expand and grow to accommodate and deliver more capability and capacity to those smarter devices. And that's, that's definitely true in the autonomous vehicle space. Um, and it, you know, it's a hard problem. I mean, uh, John talked about it, uh, Hagi talked, uh, all of us have talked about it to some degree that this uh, explosion of demand at the edge combined with the ability to trust uh, at, um, at no latency um, and, uh, and compare information across a thousand vehicles in a general area who are all communicating to each other within themselves and to external services um, is, a, is both a huge area of opportunity and a huge area of risk. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fascinating. Um, and you can draw the regression fairly easily, right? Because you had at one point dumb cars with no connectivity. Now you have smart cars with some connectivity. So you can tell it's a straight up uh, line, if not an exponentially growing line. Yeah, so we're uh, just about out of time. So maybe I can ask each of you again, maybe starting with Hagi and going east to west, um, maybe 30 second comments on anything you want to say to sum up as far as, you know, what you thought was most interesting or what the challenges for telecommunications providers are, which John just alluded to, actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, from my point of view, I think it's uh, very interesting to see that we are facing the same challenges across industries. And this is also lifting the borders of the thought process to really make sure that we are able to combine and really work the real edge uh, across any boundaries, no matter if it's a moving car or a smart city or something else, a service that is going on. And I believe this is also a good conclusion uh, for this meeting and for me at least, a good finding uh, on uh, how to move forward. John? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Yes, I mean, I, you know, I think I think there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of work and a lot of research and a lot of really interesting things happening in the space. I think one of the things that's worth mentioning that um, that we're excited about is the uh, the work that um, uh, that we and our partners at the Autonomy Institute um, are are progressing. So, with the vision of being able to deliver a plurality of sensors, uh, you know, everywhere in a dense urban environment with uh, high performance computing located at the street corner. Um, you know, we're starting this. This is happening. Uh, you know, if you check out autonomy.institute, you'll read about uh, something called the public infrastructure network node, which is how we plan to achieve plurality and multi tenancy of sensors and processing capability, um, you know, everywhere in a dense urban environment. And what we think is the future of industry forward auto infrastructure. Um, we're happy to be a part of that, uh, that organization and we're gonna play a big role in, in helping to achieve uh, the delivery of the kinds of services that will be required of the ecosystem to build all of these really cool applications and systems. Great, Mark? Yeah, I um, uh, would say that uh, uh, what I'm experiencing um, over the last six months um, outside of specific use cases which I think we've talked about a lot, um, is that the community is becoming uh, more and more aware that this is, and I think everybody on here has expressed that without specifically spelling it out, uh, is becoming more and more aware that the opportunity of the edge, the problem of the edge, however you want to define it, is not going to be solved by one company, right? They're, they're, it's not going to be an overlay of one of the big players that's going to just boom, they're going to take what they did before and they're going to call it edge and it's going to work. It's not going to be one giant telco company. Um, that this is a, an opportunity for um, coalitions. It's an opportunity for um, shared resource 
because the problems we're trying to solve for, um, uh, and when I say problems, I mean opportunities, are just way too broad and way too big um, for any one of us to think that we can handle on our own. So um, I'm getting more and more positive feedback from the operators in our network, as John pointed out, the idea of this, um, this logistics and supply chain of capa supplying capacity in, the, in global networks and in data centers. And the same thing is true with um, uh, global WAN providers, um, more and more realization that uh, there is no one uh, answer to how to solve this and, and shared, sharing the opportunity is the best way forward. Great, Professor Yang. Yes, uh, I think for uh, the telecom industry, the biggest challenge is to change their mindset. They need to uh, combine communication better with computing, uh, which is uh, unfamiliar for most of the telecom operators and the uh, equipment manufacturers. And they need to get used to uh, computing is everywhere, uh, not only uh, at the edge, but also in the cloud uh, and also inside the networks so that they can uh, be more and more open to, to, the, uh, to the new era of uh, combining uh, computing, uh, communication, and the storage resources in the distributed way to provide a better service for every industry. Thank you. OK. Well, this has been fascinating. And I know that we could spend like uh, an hour on each of the topics that were brought up with like three words. I'd love to just spend an hour on Formula One architecture and how that's evolving sort of from the racetrack to data collection and upload and 3D printing. We could do a whole thing on ambulances, on drones, on safety, on uh, entertainment in the automobile. So uh, hopefully we'll do a future session. Um, but for now, uh, just thank you all for getting up at every hour of the uh, morning, <laughs> midnight and so forth for this uh, global uh, thought leadership session on edge computing, uh, especially for automotive. Uh, I learned a lot. Hopefully uh, you and the audience learned a lot, either directly through the video or through the Q&A. And uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Joe. And we'd also like to thank all of the other panelists for this amazing discussion. To our attendees, we just want to say thank you for attending today and look out for an email that will contain a link to the survey, as well as more details of how to access this webinar again. On behalf of PTC, mahalo and have a wonderful day.